Gunpowder weaponry changed the world. Firearms and cannons fundamentally altered the landscape of power, giving rise to protracted sieges, stable nation states, large professional armies, and colonialism. Historians often call this the military revolution, but when historians discuss the impact of the military revolution, they tend to focus on Europe and the Middle East, ignoring the Indian subcontinent. This is a serious blind spot. India went through its own gunpowder transformation, and it had a massive impact, both militarily and politically. But how did India's empires adapt and engage these new technologies? Why did some powers sink and others swim during this tidal wave of change? Let's dive right in. Indian empires were first introduced to firearms in the 1200s CE, when Chinese rocket technology diffused into the northern portion of the subcontinent. While curious, these weapons did not meaningfully transform the battlefield. In fact, it wasn't until the 1400s that truly effective firearms appeared in India. During that time, the Bomani Sultanate furnished Middle Eastern powers with textiles and spices in exchange for muskets and cannons. Thus, it was the South Indian sea trade that brought early firearms and cannon technology into India. Before we explore the impact of this technology, let's quickly run through the various gunpowder weapons used in the Indian subcontinent in the 1400s and 1500s CE. Matchlock muskets came to South India in the mid-1400s, and both the Bomani Sultanate and the Vijayanagar Empire were quick to adapt to this new technology, incorporating musket-wielding infantry regiments into their armies. Matchlock firearms were easy to use and extremely powerful, delivering their projectile with roughly 10 times the force of a typical era. Musket-wielding infantry could also be equipped and trained in a short period of time, just a few months. This led to a swell in military manpower. Perhaps the most effective use of musketmen was against cavalry. When deployed against cavalry, a musketman could maim or kill an armored horse, much more effectively than a traditional archer. In Deccan, South India, the term for a cannon was Kaman Irad, or lightning bow. Though there are no surviving cannons from the 1400s, we know that cannons were widely used from at least the 1460s thanks to indirect evidence. Walls with gun ports were being built into major Bomani forts in the mid-century. There were two main categories of artillery, heavy mortars and light cannons. Heavy mortars could be extremely large and heavy, with a length of up to 9.32 meters in some cases, and weighing up to 47 tons. They were highly immobile and thus difficult to incorporate into offensives without well-planned logistics. To begin with, light cannons were smaller copies of the heavy mortar style. Later, new innovations were developed. Light cannons in the early 1500s began to feature distinctive designs, such as narrow cylindrical barrels, a prominent muzzle spout, and a long handle. These new designs indicate a change from stone cannonballs to lead cannonballs, and more efficient use of gunpowder. It also allowed Indian militaries to mount them easily in fort ramparts, sometimes on swivels. But in India, artillery did not always fire cannonballs. In fact, in the Deccan region, heavy mortar cannons were often filled with coins to create superheated buckshot. This technique allowed cannons to cover a wide area in a bullet rain, killing thousands of soldiers in a single concerted volley. Field artillery became a crucial tool on the battlefield, not only for sieges, but also in an anti-personnel capacity. Specifically, cannons were useful for scaring war elephants and countering infantry lines. But the immobility and vulnerability of cannons had to be resolved. Indian powers began to utilize animal-borne guns to improve mobility. These cannons were referred to as artillery of the stirrup. Examples include horse-drawn carriages with large mortars. They also include camel-mounted cannons known as shutaranal. Camel cannons were swivel guns that could be aimed while mounted. When ready to shoot, the soldier could force the camel to kneel and then fire the weapon. Entire groups of camel cannons could move around the battlefield with relative freedom, forcing enemies to reposition or face a massive barrage. In the 1470s, Atish Bazan, fireworkers, came to prominence in the Deccan region of South India. These soldiers would deploy explosive mines to siege forts, getting close to the fort walls and setting the mines in weak areas. Mines continued to be used in fits and spurts throughout the 1500s and early 1600s. 
so we know about the types of firearms and cannons that were in common use in late medieval India. But what was their impact on military and society? Cannons and muskets not only came to play a noteworthy role in open battles, but the use of matchlocks and cannons also added to the capacity of besieged garrisons to hold their own within fortified spaces. The enhanced importance of light cannons and muskets resulted in an enormous increase in the number of these firearms. At the Battle of Talakata in 1565, the Telugu text Ramarajna Bakir notes that there were 2,300 large cannons in addition to tens of thousands of smaller guns. With the advent of new firearm technology, the size of imperial militaries ballooned. This demanded a more effective revenue system. Innovative new taxation and administrative systems developed from Delhi down to Vijayanagar. High revenue was foundational to firearms use. In the 1400s and early 1500s, brass and bronze gunpowder weapons were extremely costly. This meant that only wealthy powers could afford to produce or purchase such weaponry at a large scale, giving an enormous advantage to central authority. Regional warlords and local principalities simply did not have the resources or infrastructure to compete in the firearms race, and for a time, the tight grip of feudalism began to wane as centralized powers exerted more control. In the late 1400s and early 1500s, the Vijayanagar Empire had to contend with rebellious Tamil chiefs in its southernmost regions. The empire was able to put down these rebellions with minimal fuss thanks to its artillery advantage, weaponry that the local chiefs simply did not have. But as firearms technology rapidly transformed, this new dynamic was threatened. The shift from bronze barrels to wrought iron barrels fundamentally changed firearm proliferation on the subcontinent. Wrought iron firearm technology was taught to Indian natives by Portuguese soldiers who defected to Kerala in 1507 CE. Wrought iron technology enabled the production of cheap cannons and muskets. The proliferation of light wrought iron guns, which were cheap to manufacture and did not require rare materials, created a need to prevent its diffusion to local chiefs who could challenge central authority. This led to attempts by Indian empires to create a central monopoly on firearms. In the Mughal Empire, for example, local blacksmiths were not allowed to produce guns without a license from the central Mughal authorities. When these prohibitions were violated, Zaminders and their peasant followers were able to launch impressive rebellions thanks to their newfound firepower. One important vector of technology transfer came via the Portuguese, some of whose own weapons were quickly assimilated into the indigenous tradition of firearms production in the Deccan. The Portuguese conquered Goa in 1510 CE. When they did, they found that the Bijapuris had already established a munitions plant in the city. According to Portuguese records, they found a great number of artillery, large and small, as well as an enormous quantity of gunpowder and metal guns. They also found tools necessary for making such weaponry. Many new developments came from renegades and other ne'er-do-wells. Portuguese defectors brought wrought iron gunsmithing to India. Meanwhile, camel cannons and cradle mortars came from the resettlement of Turks involved in battles with the Portuguese in the early 1500s. These Turks were financed and given the infrastructure necessary to build plants for the manufacture of iron and bronze ordnance. Venetian and Genoese renegades also inhabited Goa and other enclaves on the west coast of India, considerably enriching and expanding the native firearms industry. Thanks to these early foreign influences, the gunsmiths of India were making high quality firearms in fact, after the Portuguese took control of Goa in 1510, Afonso de Albuquerque was so impressed with the gunsmithing skills he encountered in India that he sent a native master gunsmith to the King of Portugal. He noted that in India, the gunsmiths made arms superior to the best of Europe. This new Indo-Portuguese Arab-infused style of firearms spread throughout India, Southeast Asia, and even as far as Japan. Though the Vijayanagar Empire was quick to incorporate gunpowder technology into its armies, it never truly committed to continuing innovation. For example, Vijayanagar was less committed to developing the infrastructure for producing such weapons at scale. There's no evidence that they ever built an arsenal or matchlock foundry. By examining the Vijayanagar response to gunpowder weapons, we'll gain further insight into why some empires fail to keep up with the times and why others catapult ahead. Let's begin in 1520 CE with the two-part Battle of Raichur. The battle was between Ishmael Adil Shah of the Bijapur Sultanate and Krishnadevaraya of the Vijayanagar Empire. 
Krishnadevaraya brought with him an enormous traditional army of cavalry and infantrymen. He also brought several cannons, though they were barely used in the operation. Ishmael Adil Shah had a smaller army, but had a significant artillery advantage. He fielded 400 heavy cannons and 900 gun carriages, and he believed that the strength of his artillery would allow a quick victory. He couldn't have been more wrong. Ishmael Adil Shah deployed his artillery ineffectively. Instead of staggering the volleys, he made the tactical mistake of firing all cannons at once. As a result, they could not reload and fire successive rounds quickly enough before being overwhelmed by Krishnadevaraya's swift cavalry. When Krishnadevaraya moved ahead to sieging Raichur Fort, he had to contend with another gunpowder-related disadvantage. And again, he circumvented this disadvantage by abusing his opposition's strategic failures. The Bijapur defenders in Raichur Fort had artillery mounted on the ramparts, several hundred heavy and light cannons. The problem, however, is that Bijapur's gunners were unable to maneuver their cannons so as to screen the walls with flanking fire. Being fixed in their gun ports along the fort's curtain walls, the cannons were virtually immobile. Each shot fired from those cannons would land in nearly the same predictable spot in front of the fort. As a result, Krishnadevaraya's men were able to approach the wall with pickaxes and dismantle it without suffering high casualties. Krishnadevaraya's victory blinded him. He remained confident as to the effectiveness of conventional warfare. Krishnadevaraya had easily overcome his enemy's cannons in both the open field and in the siege context, and so his successors were lulled into complacency. For the rest of its existence, the Vijayanagara Empire failed to take cannon technology as seriously as they should have. By contrast, defeat drove Bijapur to reflect on why they had lost. Instead of abandoning artillery, the Bijapur Sultanate and its other Dakani neighbors sought to learn from their mistakes, and they developed a series of technological solutions that would resolve many of the weaknesses that had doomed them at the Battle of Raichur. Newly engineered mounting systems, trunnions and swivel forks, allowed heavy cannons to have both vertical and lateral movement. Many guns could be aimed and fired 360 degrees and replaced on high bastion platforms. This meant that they could bombard enemy positions before the attackers could effectively lay siege. An offensive approach to defense. A single gun could command an unusually wide swath of terrain. When the Battle of Talakata was waged in 1565, the wide gap in military technology between Vijayanagar and the Deccan Sultanates was revealed. It's worth noting that Vijayanagar did not lack firepower when it fought the Battle of Talakata. Its leader, Ramaraya, fielded 70,000 cavalry and more than 90,000 infantry, with significant numbers of musketmen. Further, Ramaraya interspersed 1,000 cannons between 2,000 war elephants. Ramaraya initiated the battle by firing nearly 50,000 rockets, muskets, and cannons at the army of the Deccan Sultanates. But despite the immense firepower that Vijayanagar brought to the table, the Deccan Sultanates more effectively used their own firepower. They had 600 cannons of different calibers arranged in three rows and fastened together with strong chains so as to prevent Vijayanagar's cavalry from breaking through the lines. In the first row were 200 heavy cannons, in the second row were 200 intermediate cannons, and in the third row were light swivel cannons. All the artillery was under the command of Chalabi Rumi Khan, a Turk who had served in Europe with distinction. Archers were used to mask the guns and shower arrows on approaching infantry, falling back to let the guns fire when appropriate. The effective use of guns in the Battle of Talakata was key to the Deccan Sultanate's victory, but it was after the battle that the technology gap was made even more clear. Vijayanagar fell to the invaders shortly after the loss of the Battle of Talakata, which is rather strange. The capital and nearby forts should have been capable of resisting a siege, but the defenders chose to flee. Why? In fact, the defenders knew that they had no chance of resisting a siege with their forts. Unlike the Deccan Sultanates, the Vijayanagar Empire had not upgraded its forts as cannon technology developed. They hadn't even bothered to develop semicircular bastions, cannons with lateral and vertical movement, wide walkways on ramparts, projecting turrets, broad moats, tower flanked gateways, wall extensions, and anything else. Instead, Vijayanagar's forts remained what they were in the days of the Battle of Raichur, stone walls built without mortar and punctuated by square bastions. 
And so when the Deccan Sultanate's armies marched down to the Vijayanagar capital, it lay helpless before the advancing threat. No attempt was made to repel the onslaught. In fact, no viable attempt could have been made to defend it. And now you know.